Hello, welcome to uh, lecture 32. This is uh, uh, this is going to cover section 6.4 in JIAM, uh, General Introduction to the Art of Mathematics. I'm Joe Fields. Uh, so this this particular lecture is on ordering relations. We've previously done relations in general and then equivalence relations. This is the the second major branch in the in the relations world. Um, the plan for today is, uh, as usual, to introduce the topic. Uh, we'll then use um, a visualization tool known as HASA diagrams. I believe it's Helmut. Helmut Hassa uh, first created them. And then there's a uh, there's quite a bit of terminology that goes along with um, with ordering relations. So. We'll run through that and give you examples of everything. And uh, that, unfortunately, is just a bit of a, you, you need to memorize the terms because they do get used all the time. OK, let's go. Um, so what is an ordering relation? Well, um, first, I want to make a, a contrast between total and partial orders. Um, the, the less than or equal sign has been I've, I've said it previously is, is sort of the prototype we use for ordering relations, but the less than or equal sign does something rather strong to the real numbers. It puts them in a, in a distinct order. There's, um, it's also called a linear order or a total order. The, um, the thing is any pair of numbers at all can be compared using less than or equal and you can decide which one is smaller or if they're equal. Of course, if, if you think you've got a pair of numbers, it wouldn't quite make sense to say you, <laughs> that they were equal because, you know, it's a pair, two distinct things. Well, uh, partial orders happen probably more often than that. That's, that's just a little bit stronger than you can imagine. Um, for instance, uh, an interesting real world example is predation. What animals eat, what other animals. And that's not really a total order. Um, there isn't sort of a pick any pair of animals and one of them eats the other one. You know, some things just don't don't predate one another. For instance, what if both of them are vegetarians? Right? They don't. They're not going to eat one another. Um, but even if they're not, you know, if you have a a bear, which can be carnivorous, they tend to stay on the the vegetarian side. But they're omnivores like human beings. Um, the, uh, the bear is rarely going to take on something like a bison. I mean, actually, I saw a video where they did that, but, you know, it's not the usual thing. So there's two things. Oh, wait, the bison's a herbivore. Well, I'm sure we can think of two carnivorous animals that still don't eat one another because, you know, you, you don't like to, to have to get into a fight with something that's a near match to yourself in the animal kingdom. You, it's uh, the stakes are too high. If you get a slight injury, it can mean that your time is over. So that's an example of a partial order, and we'll see many others. Um, that the big issue is comparability. Is it always possible to compare two things? And in a total order, it is. You can, if you have have two distinct things, then the order is going to tell you which one is bigger, which one is smaller. They can be compared, but in a partial order, not so much. So yes, we we do have these these things are modeled after less than or equal, but recognize that not necessarily as as strong as less than or equal. You may have incomparable elements. So here's the official definition: a relation R on a set S. This is a homogeneous relation, right? Because it's on a single set, it goes from that set to itself. Anyway, a relation R on a set S is an ordering relation if it is, and there's three properties. We seen another example of this three properties deal. Reflexive, yeah, anti-symmetric. Oh, that's the different one. And transitive. So note that it's got the same first and last properties as equivalence relations, but instead of symmetric, it's forced to be anti-symmetric. So uh, there is another official definition. Some people make a choice different from the one I've done. Mine is the most popular choice, I think. But um, some people will, will define an ordering relation in, as a kind of an analog of less than rather than less than or equal. So what properties then would it have? Well, it would be irreflexive, also anti-symmetric and transitive. 
I don't, I don't call that an ordering relation, but that is something to watch out for. If, uh, if you're reading a book, they may use the term and not necessarily say it, but they're talking about a strict ordering relation in this case. Um, yeah, so we either talk about a strict ordering or an irreflexive ordering relation, which is obvious, I suppose. Yeah. Remember when we did digraphs, directed graphs? Here's another one of these contracted words. Math people tend to not like to say too many syllables, I guess. So rather than saying partially ordered set over and over again, they just say poset, P-O-S-E-T, poset. Um, so a poset is a set S together with a relation R on S that is an ordering relation. And make sure we're back to my standard, which means that ordering relation is reflexive. So we have something like less than or equal. Uh, okay, why does it say this? Let's do exercise one in section 6.4. Cool. That's on page 273, and I'm not there yet. What's the better way to go? Should I scroll or should I? <laughs> uh, okay, wow. This exercise actually is the uh, the predation thing. I, I just accidentally, because I made these slides a little while ago, I, I forgot that I had this example in here. So we've got a collection of animals, and some animals eat other animals. But, well, I guess not everything's an animal. There's grass down here at the bottom. Grass is eaten by ducks and cows and geese. Saying the robin, I think a robin will occasionally eat grass, but whatever. Uh, here we're saying worms get eaten by geese and the robin. Somehow I bet uh, a cow who's eating grass occasionally gets worms in their mouth. And <laughs> similar for the duck, but again, just just take it for how it's been. You could argue some of these points. Foxes eat ducks and robins, but cows are too big for them, and geese are maybe a little too big. I suspect. Maybe a fox could eat a goose, too, and if it was really hungry. Um, alligators eat ducks and geese. Again, not likely to go for a cow unless it's a really big alligator. And robins just aren't big enough for them to be worth their while. So they go over these medium-sized uh, herbivores. Okay. So that's, do you see how that's a partial order, not a total order? There isn't. You know, if you look at, for instance, the fox and the alligator, can you decide which one predates which one? We're, we've already said neither one is likely to eat the other. I'm pretty sure a fox is never going to eat an alligator, and I think a fox is too fast for an alligator to catch, although alligators are surprisingly fast if they're over, over short distances. Anyway, um, similarly, you know, ducks and cows, do they ever eat one another? Yeah. So you've got these incomparable items in here. Uh, my favorite ordering, well, I'm not sure if it's my favorite, but I, I like it a lot, is the divisibility relation. It's a, an ordering, and so uh, it is the sort of thing that's like less than or equal. It's got the reflexive property. Uh, it's not a strict order. Why? Because, well, a number always divides itself, yeah? So you, you do get reflexiv reflexivity really quickly in that ordering relation. Um, Going back to Jiam for a second, we're going to look at the divisors of 12. I think I have to go backwards in Jiam now to, to find that spot. 267. It's only a couple of pages back, so I'll scroll. Here's the divisors of 12. Well, you can see it in the, in the uh, caption or the bottom of this figure. 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, and 12. So it's not all the numbers from 1 to 12. It's just the ones that happen to be divisors of 12. And um, you're seeing it in two different ways. Here's the strict ordering, where we're using less than or equals, really, to, uh, to put them in order. Or you could say less than. And then here's the partial order, where we're looking at the true divisibility relation. See how 1 goes into 2 and 1 goes into 3? Um, it's also true that one goes into six, but um, this picture has a convention on it that if um, if you could just follow a trail up to something, then that counts. So you don't need the straight line from one to six because one goes to three and three goes to six. 
Uh, anyway, yeah, one divides everybody. There's trails from one to any of the points or the other, I shouldn't say points, numbers on the page. Um, two and three, those are incomparable, right? Neither one divides the other. Four and six, also incomparable. But there's a trail from like two up, excuse me, up to 12. So two divides 12, and et cetera. So that's, the, by the way, you're seeing a, a, a HACA diagram right there. We will talk about it more in a sec, but that's your first example of one. So yeah, here we go, HACA diagrams. Um, one of the features in the thing we were just looking at is that the direction wasn't on those uh, those lines. Do you notice how I had, had line? Can I, can I pop back and forth between these things? You notice I just had lines on here? Well, really there's a direction. One thing divides the other. So one divides two and one divides three. It should have an arrow that way. What we've got is just vertical position on the page decides that. So think if you needed to put in arrows, they always go up. And it's always possible to make your HACA diagram such that you know, there's a there's a single direction that will determine the the uh, the arrowheads. Uh, so vertical position det determines the direction. I'm going to put this back where it belongs. Um, there normally would be loops in a in a HACA diagram in a, in a the digraph version of a ordering relation because we we decided it was going to be reflexive, right? But if they're going to be everywhere, why do you need to draw them all? <laughs> sort of another laziness moment. You just say, okay, vertical position will give us the direction of the arrows so we don't have to draw arrowheads. And loops are there, but, you know, why beat a dead horse? You, you don't need to draw them in. And also, don't show connections that can be deduced because of transitivity. Now, that bears pointing out in the, in the other diagram. Um, remember how I said one, when there was a trail from one thing to the other, that told you that, that, like, for instance, one divides four? Well, that's exactly the transitivity sort of situation. Because one divides two, and because two divides four, we get that one divides four. So we know that that connection is there. Why bother having to draw it? Again, you can, you can make less marks and still be able to understand who goes into who in, the, in this relation. So now it's asking us to look at pages 269 and 270 in JIAM, and that is, uh, once again, to, to see some examples. I am having a hard time getting the screen up. There it is. So 269, that's two pages forward. Ooh, well, that's an interesting one. That is the divisors of 17, partially ordered by the divisibility relation. Now, uh, it, it mentions this is a graded post set. A graded post set is one where there's actually a function that tells you kind of where things lie in the, in the low layers of this thing. See how there's 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 are values. Or the, it's like a layer cake, basically. Um, what are those numbers? I'll, I can just, I'll, I think it'll be quick to, uh, to point it out in this case. If you look at the total of the exponents, like see how there's a three on the two and a one on the three, the total of those is something like the degree of the thing, although it's a number. And usually we mean degree when we're talking about polynomials. But these guys both have degree two, uh, four. This is the one that has degree five. This has, you know, if it did have an exponent on anything, it would be zero. These two and three are actually the primes that divide the 72, so they appear in this bottom layer to the first power, degree one. Okay. Um, so it kind of looks like a window pane, but turned on a side, on, on a, at an angle. The incomparable things don't have lines between them. And in fact, in this case, they're in the same, uh, in the same layer, for instance, you'll find things that are incomparable. I believe there's some incomparables that are also, uh, yeah, like look at 4 and 18. They're in different layers, but can you decide that one divides the other? Well, look at the prime factorization. If you're dividing 18, you have to be built of 2s and 3s, and the exponent on n2 had better be less than 1. The exponent on 3 has to be less than 2. Well, 4 
unfortunately has a, a too big of an exponent on its two. The fact that there's no three present is fine. You could still have like, for instance, uh, two divides 18, but four doesn't. So those are incomparable things in different layers. Uh, all right. Well, that's, that's one example. Let's look at, it said there was another one on page 270. Oops, I guess not. Maybe I got the page number wrong. I bet you I meant this other diagram. This is a, a, a whole different uh, setup, not the visibility anymore. Um, in fact, you can see that those elements there are the sets, the subsets of one, two, three. So the, uh, the elements are the, of the partially ordered set are the things in the power set of one, two, three. And oh, it says it in the, in the caption for this. It's partially ordered by set containment. That makes sense that empty set is down here at the bottom, right? Because every, the empty set is in everything. <laughs> and, and because of the transitivity is implied by a path, uh, empty set goes into the set two, or is an element of the set is contained in. I've got to be careful about my terms. These are sets, so I'm talking about containment. Empty set is contained in the singleton two, but it's also contained in the singleton one two, kind of for two different reasons. One because of that path and one because of that path. It's also in the set one, two, three for lots of different reasons. There's a lot of paths that go from the empty set up to one, two, three. That's interesting. If you, if you notice the uh, geometry of this, you, you may not see it at first because it looks like a hexagon, but it also looks like a cube kind of turned on its, turned in and held up on one corner. Uh, and the empty set and the set one, two, three would be at diagonally opposite corners of a cube like that. So what is the, uh, what is the grading function here? Can you tell? It's not so, it's fairly obvious if you look at it. All the singletons are in one line. All the, the sets with two elements are in another layer. The only three element set is up there at the top and the only zero element set is at the bottom. The, the grading function is the, uh, cardinality of the sets. How many elements are in them? So graded post sets. Often you can find a function that determines the heights in a HASA diagram. And, and when you can, that's extra. That's great. But um, don't, don't count on it always being the case. It's kind of bad that the two examples I just showed you had a grading function because quite often there isn't one. Um, so what is a graded post set? Well, it has the set, it has the ordering relation, and it also has this function whose domain is the set S. And I guess we require something of that function. What do we say here? If X and Y are distinct and X is related to Y, then the function evaluated on those two things has to go in the, in the appropriate order. That phi of X is less than phi of Y if X are Y. If X are Y, then I think I just said that backwards, logically backwards, I mean. So what we have is the antecedent here is distinct things that are related, X are Y. And from that, we conclude, the conclusion is the function at X is smaller than the function at Y. So this tells us that things that are mapped to the same value can't be comparable, but there may be other things that are also not comparable, as we saw in the divisors of 72. There's an example on page 271. It says, I, I think the pagination in GIM has changed since the last time I uh, updated that slide, because I think they're talking about that one, 269. Yeah. So this doesn't have a grading function. Sorry. Yeah, we were definitely, I was definitely talking about this guy, where the, where the the function is add up all the exponents in the in the prime factorization of the numbers. Gives you a grading. Oh yeah, now we have all this terminology to, to learn. <laughs> okay. So first off is chains. Chains are really an important idea in, in post sets. Um, a chain in a post set is a subset of all the elements, a subset of the elements, all of which are comparable. So if we look at, that one's a little busy. Let's look at this one with the predation. A chain, for instance, would be the path that goes from grass through duck up to alligator. Of course, grass, duck, fox is perfectly fine too. 
as is worms, robin, fox. Even just a pair of things that are related would be a chain, right? Worms, come, worms goose, that's a chain because it's just a set of things that are indeed com comparable. But usually we're looking for sort of bigger chains. <laughs> we like to get, actually, we like to get chains as big as possible. Oh, what about anti-chains? Well, this is the idea of a pile of things that can't be compared. Back to this example. Um, how about cow, duck, robin, goose? All of those guys are anti-chain, or those guys form an anti-chain. But any pair of, comp of, of incomparable things would be an anti-chain. It's just like I said, you, you try to usually find the biggest ones of these things you can. So what is it? What is this uh, idea of finding the biggest you can? It's actually what's known as maximality or a chain. Well, let's do it for chains first. A chain is maximal if you couldn't add anything to it. If I look at the chain um, worms and goose, it's not bad, but you could go farther. Worms, goose, alligator. Now, once I've gone worms, goose, alligator, there's nothing else I could stick in that chain. I've gone from, from something at the very bottom of the post set to something at the very top. So that's a maximal chain, those three things. Worms, robin, fox, though, is maximal too. Maximal doesn't imply unique. A lot of people will make that uh, assumption, but it's not true. What about um, maximality for anti-chains? It's the same idea. If you can't tack on anything new, you've made as big as it's possible to make of an anti-chain. So fox and alligator is a chain, excuse me, an anti-chain. Grass and worms is an anti-chain, but goose, robin, duck, cow is a big anti-chain. And I think that's one that if we added anything else, we'd have comparability. You can't add anything above because we'd have compar comparisons there. Um, yeah, I think that that four element anti-chain is as big as you can get in this uh, kind of silly example. All right, what else? Oh, covers, what is a cover? Well, it's also known as an immediate successor. It's something that is above you in the uh, partial order and that there's a relation between you. The, the line in the Hessen diagram exists. An element is maximal if it doesn't have a cover. Now, so we're, we've used the same word now for two different things. Maximal chains and anti-chains are as big as possible. A maximal element is something which has nobody laying above it. We're turning to here. We had our three element maximal chains, our four element maximal anti-chain, but maximal elements, that's fox and alligator. Again, not necessarily unique. The anti-chain turned out to be the maximal anti-chain turned out to be unique, but there's lots of maximal chains, and there are two maximal elements. What about minimal? Well, I, I don't think, I suppose you could talk about minimality for chains and anti-chains. That would be a, a chain or an anti-chain with a single element. Of course, nothing is, or maybe a minimal would be even worse, have it be an empty collection. I'm not sure what minimal would mean for those, but for elements, it does mean, make perfect sense. It, it isn't the cover for anybody else. It's at the bottom. Um, what are the minimal elements here? Grass and worms. The base of the food chain. Actually, that's funny. They call it a food chain, don't they? But it's really a net or a poset. What's a top and what's a bottom? Well, you may not have these. If you have a single greatest element, that's called the top of the poset. So in predation, there isn't one. There's there's two different maximal elements. In scroll back to divisors of 72 ordered by divisibility, there's a top, 72, and there's a bottom, one. In the uh, subsets ordered by inclusion, the empty set is the bottom and the entire set is the top. Um, I, why should this remind you of relative and absolute maxima and minima? Well, the top and the bottom are like absolute. It's the biggest value. Uh, the other things, maximal elements, they're like relative minima or maxima. They're, they're sort of bigger for the things nearby, but there might be somebody else who's their match or, or even bigger. All right, so we're going to do, uh, we're going to, 
try to cover exercise 6.4 in Jaya. I think I just said that wrong. Exercise 2 in section 6.4. This is a, an exercise about this diagram. And so it asks us to do some matching here. All right, I have clues together a way to get us uh, a view of the post set we're interested in on the screen at the same time as the, the question we're trying to answer. And, and this is nice because I'm able to write on that. So even though it's a little, little problem with getting the focus just right. Uh, anyway, let's see if we can do this, this exercise. So the post set is this one we've been uh, discussing with the the animals and grass and, and uh, who eats who on here. Um, let's see. Let's see if we can figure out what this first one is. A non-maximal antichain. An antichain that's not maximal. So something could be added to it. Hmm. Do you remember before I, I mentioned that the, the, the antichain right across the middle here? Robin and goose and duck and cow. That was as big as it could get. Um, those are all incomparable things, and there's four of them. If we're going to have something that's not maximal, then we need to have incomparable things, but maybe fewer than four. Uh, look at this one. Cow, duck, and goose. Those are incomparable. They're, it's, it's this one I've just discussed, except missing the robin. All right, so... Um, that seems like our, our non-maximal anti-chain. It's a set of incomparable things, but you could make it bigger. A maximal anti-chain. Well, look, chains and anti-chains are sets. So it's, it's only, the only possibilities are that one, this one, this one, or I guess the, there isn't one. Do you think there is not a maximal anti-chain? Well, I think we already convinced ourselves that cow, duck, robin, goose was a maximal anti-chain. But that's not here. That's not one of the choices. So is there another set that provides an anti-chain that is maximal? And um, my pen is just accidentally pointing at it. Fox, alligator, cow. That's, those things are all incomparable. Let's see. Alligator. Ah, oh, sorry. Alligator and cat and fox are certainly incomparable, but cow is also not comparable to them. Uh, no foxes are eating cows, and no alligators are eating cows, and vice versa. Cows are not well; they're vegetarians, so they don't eat the, the other animals. All right. So, uh, in a sense, you could think about stretching the cow thing up to this top level, and it would be a, a more clear that it's an anti-chain. But um, is that really maximal? Well, the, the question is, is not, is it the longest one around? It's, the question is, could we add anything else to it? So can we add anything else to cow, fox, alligator? Um, well, we certainly can't add anything on the uh, rest of the middle tier, right? If we had a duck, fox is reading that. You've got some pair of things that are compatible, comparable. Robin, foxes are eating robins, geese, alligators are eating geese. So none of those are good. What about things on the bottom tier? Maybe we can add one of those. Well, cow tells us we can't add grass because we'd have something else comparable to cow, something that cow eats. What about worms? Well, you might first say foxes don't eat worms, they eat robins, but the robins eat worms. And this is the concept of a food chain. Um, in a sense, the fox is eating the worms if he eats the robins, who's got worms in its belly. Or if maybe a better way to think about it, if, if there was some environmental toxin that was in the worms and the robins ate the worms, now the fox is going to get a dose of that toxin from eating the robin. So uh, that, that's the transitivity here. It might not quite make sense in terms of the, the phrase I used for this uh, post set, calling it predation as the... Uh, as the relation, but what's really going on is predation or predation of something, you know, the, the, the chain, the food chain idea. All right, so that's our friend here, fox, alligator, and cow, that's F. 
Uh, next, we're asked to find a maximal element. And then, well, a maximal element. What could be a maximal element? Something up, to, up high. Well, it's either the fox or the alligator. And if you look at the choices, there is no alligator. So it's the fox. Uh, what else? A non-maximal chain. There's only two sets left. Um, and they are worms, robin, fox. That's, well, that's a maximal chain. And grass, duck. That's a non-maximal chain. Do you see the difference between those two? Grass and duck can be extended either up to fox or up to alligator. Whereas worms, robin, fox, it's already as long as it can get in the post set. Cool. So H is the maximal one. And D is the non-maximal one. Hey, we're almost there. There's not too much left to do. A cover for worms, something that lies above worms. It's either goose or robin, the way I read it. And robin's not one of the choices, so I guess it's goose. A least element and a minimal element are our remaining choices. A least element versus a minimal element. What's the difference? A least element is a synonym for a bottom. The, the smallest, it's like the absolute minimum in a, in a calculus situation. It's the unique smallest thing. And there isn't one. Oh, that's one of the options, E. There isn't a least element. And so that must mean that A is a minimal element. Sure it is, grass. It's down there at the bottom. But there's also worms as a minimal element. That just isn't one of our choices. Great. Let's uh, let's go back to our usual view of things. Oh, I'm going to want that uh, that drawing thing again soon enough. But um, the last thing I want to point out to you is the the family of graphs that are known as hypercubes, which arise as Hasse diagrams. So they're they're kind of a cool category of graphs. I wonder if I can see this. Yay, there's a, uh, there's a picture of a series of graphs that um, they describe in the, in the text. Just gonna just move it over a little bit. The first one is a single point. The second one is two copies of a single point with a line between them. The third one is two copies of what we just made with lines in between them. And the fourth one, in a sense, I probably should call these the zeroth, first, second, and third one, because that's a cube. Can you see that that's a cube in perspective? But a cube can be thought of as two squares with all the lines that connect corresponding points in the two squares drawn in. Um, the, the question here, this, this uh, exercise in Jaya, I'm asked you to next make a, a careful drawing of the next thing up in this, in this uh, sequence, a hypercube. But... Let's, um, let's first see that these things are actually what I claim. They're the, uh, they come from Hasse diagrams of power sets partially ordered by inclusion. I'm going to kind of fit those over there. And here, let's just take this out of the way. Um, Take that out of the way too. So the first thing we had was a graph that was a single point. I want to claim that that is the Hasse diagram for the set of subsets of the empty set ordered by inclusion. Why? Because that's a zero element set. So it will have one thing in its power set. Two to the zero is one. Um, and the only thing in that set is the empty set itself. There's nothing else to make a connection to, so then, you know, you've got this sort of minimal case. What if we had a situation where we had a single element set? Now there's two elements in the power set. And we can label them. One of the bottom one is the empty set. The top one is the set itself. Is there a subset containment relation between these things? Sure enough, there's that. So you get a point is the zero-dimensional cube, the line segment, 
is a one dimensional cube. If we make the same diagram with a two element set, things become a bit more interesting. You end up with a square, although normally conventionally drawn up on an, on an edge. Um, it has the empty set at the bottom, the two singleton sets at the mid level, and the full set one and two at the top. Empty set is contained in everything, but this last containment between the empty set and one two is deduced by uh, transitivity. And so this this the has a diagram of a two element set. The three element set, well, it gets a little tough to draw, but I'm gonna return us to the slides because I did it in the computer <laughs> and it's a little bit uh, easier to see in that. Whoops, wrong thing. Come on. Back to the sides. So, whoops, went too far. Um, okay. What we've just talked about is power sets, partially ordered by set inclusion. Um, notice that that gives us a graded post set. You see how I drew the layers over there in the in the picture, sorry, the picture's been hidden now, but I, put, I drew those things in layers. It's because that's the grading. We went from zero elements, one elements to two elements, or zero just to one in this uppercase. So the cardinality of the sets provides a grading there. Um, we've drawn a few, we did that part. Here's the, the, the actual cube cube, the three dimensional cube or the subsets of one, two, three ordered via inclusion. And I just want you to see that you'll also, whoops, I'll come back to that. You'll also see the um, the pair of, of sort of parallel squares in this. Um, you see the empty set, sorry, it's off the bottom of the page a little bit, but the empty set, singleton one, singleton two, and singleton one, two, might be sort of the bottom left face of the cube. Well, a copy of that is made over here in the top right, partial face of the cube. And the difference between these things is in each case, we just added three to the set. So to start with the empty set, add three to it. Certainly those of the empty set is contained in that uh, singleton. Start with the, uh, the singleton two and add three to it. Of course, the singleton two is in the set two, three. You see how these, these inclusions that go between the two squares we're constructing work? Finally, I, I've revealed this a couple of times by mistake, but there's the, uh, the four-dimensional version of a hypercube. Um, not the clearest picture um, because I'm trying to stick something four-dimensional into a flat surface. It's, it's difficult. But you can see all the features that we've talked about. Um, we have a, a least element, the empty set. We have a greatest element, one, two, three, four. That is, there's a top and a bottom. Uh, we have nice anti-chains that are determined by a grading function, although there are other anti-chains in here, but the, the things of the same grade are definitely incomparable. Um, so the, the, this really big anti-chain in here with six elements in it uh, amongst the two element subsets. Uh, what else? What else? It's tough to see the cubes. <laughs> this is this picture actually has two s sort of parallel cubes and, and then offset from one another. I, I built the thing using um, zone tools. So uh, it's this is a hypercube as well. And we're going to need to blow up this window so that you can see it more properly. Um, the I'm holding it now by the bottom back away a little. And you'll, you should notice that the, the node I'm holding, by the way, have, has people seen these toys before? Zone tool is great fun for doing mathematical type stuff. Uh, I, I should, I, I'm not making any commercial endorsements, but I, I really enjoy this thing. It's called zone tool. So if you, if you're taking classes in a math department, probably anywhere in the world, just ask around. There's probably somebody who has a bunch of zone tools to play with. Um, if not, I actually recommend buying a cop, buying a small set of them for yourself. They're fun. They're kind of like Tinker Toys, but for more grown-up people. Yeah. 
Anyway, this one that I'm holding, you should notice that there are uh, yellow, red, and then two different blue struts that come out of it. The two blue struts are different lengths, so it's easy to tell them apart. So you know, we've got a sort of a short blue and then a much longer blue. Um, that feature that one of each type is present at each node, uh, it, it follows. It, it's actually uh, a, a true statement. Like the top of the post set is up here, and it's got a yellow, a red, and both of the, the blue sizes. The main reason I'm showing you this this graph, though, is that it this version of the graph a it's three dimensional, so you can see it in motion, which is kind of interesting. But the um, the parallel cubes are very visible in it. You see that the um, blue the long blue struts separate this out into something that's isomorphic to a cube at the top and a different thing that's isomorphic to a cube at the bottom. They're actually quite squished and distorted, but still they have the, the, the graph geometry of a, of a cube. All right, well, that brings us to the end of this section. I hope you've enjoyed it. I think ordering relations are kind of a fun topic. I want to make a plug for, for going back to Jiam now and, and reading the section, rereading the section now that you know, you probably get a better understanding of things to really, you know, nail down your knowledge and um, maybe take a gander at section 6.4 before moving on to the next, um, <laughs> the next video. Anyway, hope you have a great rest of your day.